Currently, we are studying uh, Peter's first epistle, if you'll turn there. First Peter, uh, written to those who are scattered throughout the region of what would be modern-day Turkey today. And we've kind of gotten stuck in the introduction because it's so beautiful and we have to look at the view, right? You can't go to the Grand Canyon and just take a glimpse and say that was satisfying. John Piper said, we are knee deep in the doctrine of the Trinity and the electing love and purposes of salvation of the chosen and the elect before Peter even says, howdy, grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Doesn't it just kind of fit his personality when we began Peter looking at him? It just, he writes exactly the way I expected him to write. And so we have seen some deep and profound truth in these first two verses. Peter's first words to a suffering church that has been dispersed is, I want you to know that you are chosen aliens. You've been chosen by God and you are aliens. You don't belong here. You live here, but your true citizenship is in heaven. You're journeying to glory. And so we are chosen aliens. I want you, Peter says, to get that. That's life-changing. And then he takes us deep into this doctrine of election. And he shows us how the whole Trinity was working together as one to bring about your salvation, which would glorify himself. And all three of the Trinity played a special and very unique function to bring us into the grace in which we now stand this morning. We looked at the source of our election. It was according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. All of these were modifying participle phrases, this main point that you were chosen. And so God did it by the foreknowledge, which we saw was really for love. It was him setting his love upon you before the foundation of the world. The source of your election is the love of God freely bestowing it upon you before you were born or could have done anything good or bad, the free gracious choice of God to love you. And then we looked at the sphere of our election last week, and it was by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So we had this eternal decree of God where he set his love on you, and then in time and space, we saw Jesus came in and accomplished redemption. We looked at that, and then in time and space, he takes those eternal decrees and he brings them to the present where the sanctifying work of the Spirit raises you as a dead corpse, gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. He gives you now a love. We saw that faith and repentance were gifts from God. And so you were dead and God made you alive to him in Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit now setting you apart for God. You've been taken from that sphere of death and lostness, and you still live in that sphere, but you are completely new. You are a new creation. You're a chosen alien right in the middle of a fallen race that hates the living God. Then we'll look this morning at the purpose then of our election. What is the purpose? And in verse 2, we'll finish up, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. And so I pray that we would be taken up with these things, that they would grasp us, that they would take hold of us, and that we truly would get that we are chosen aliens. I I just believe we'll never be the same if you could lay hold that I have been loved by God before the foundation of the world, and he has now called me to himself. I'm an alien. I don't belong here. I love everything different than what this world loves. I hate what it loves, and I love what it hates. I just, I can't get over what God has done. So we would live lives that show that this world then is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven where we eagerly wait for a savior. We are waiting for Jesus Christ to come back and and, and bring in this new kingdom forever and eternally. And so we pray, God, help us. May grace and peace be ours in the fullest measure to live out what we're going to look at this morning. So I would like to go before God and pray because I I want us to be a people who obey the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done everything necessary for that. He's given us his spirit and his word. And so I'm asking him that every heart would leave here this morning absolutely devoted and committed to the name that's above every name. And all I want to do is obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the new birth That's what he puts within our heart. So let's go before him and ask that very thing. Father, we thank you for this introduction that Peter 
has given to us. God, I feel like we are a church on the verge of great persecution. Lord, we're, we're a nation that has lost its moorings. It is drifting quickly. And the common graces that surrounded this nation are diminishing. And so, God, we see a growing and an increasing persecution. And so what a perfect letter for us. How are we to deal with this? God, I pray by your spirit that you would manifest to every believing heart that they are chosen aliens. God, I pray that, that we would really live different, that we would live like those who have a hope with the one who is seated at your right hand this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we would live in the hope of the resurrection. God, because Christ was resurrected, all those attached to him by faith will be resurrected unto eternal life. And so God, let that be the driving influence of every heart this morning. And Lord, let, let us walk out of here with a deeper commitment to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if there needs to be repentance this morning, I pray that you would grant that. If there needs to just be hearts awakened again, stirred to the glories and the beauties of this gospel, I, I pray that you would do that in our midst. So let every heart now just um, be pliable. God, let us be open to the word of God. Do your work in us. Help us to put off the busyness of all that we had this week, the trials, the tribulations, the pressures, the squeezings. God, would you now just let it by your spirit just be us sitting here with you and your word and that you would minister it now to us. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. First Peter chapter 1. I want to take a look in verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, here's the purpose, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So God set his love on us before the foundation of the world. He marked us off. That's that word chosen, the electing. He did it now in time and space. The Spirit drew us to Christ. He opened our eyes to believe upon him, to see him as the pearl of great price. He granted us in 2 Timothy 2 the gift of repentance. He marked us off for God. He set us apart from this mass of humanity, and now he has set us apart to obey Jesus Christ. He didn't just beam us up to heaven. He, he made us new. He made us his own, and he left us here on this earth as these citizens that don't belong but do for a very specific purpose. He left you here to obey Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He didn't just set his love and choose us before the foundation of the world. He even chose the good works that you would do when you came onto this earth. He prepared them beforehand that you would walk in them. He desires that we would walk in obedience then to Jesus Christ. This is so simple and clear. I don't want you to miss it. Salvation is unto a life of obedience to Jesus Christ. You have been justified. You are declared not guilty. You are made right with God. You are made right in your own heart and in God's heart to now live the way you were designed in relationship to God to obey him and to reflect him and to manifest him to this sphere that is outside the kingdom of God, this world. You are now submissive to God's will. He says, I will take that stony heart and I'll give you a new one. I will write my laws in your heart. It's now in the heart. It's internal. It's on the inside, this desire to obey Christ. In Romans 6, Paul said, thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, this is what you were like in Adam. You were due losses. You were willing servants of sin. You did it most willfully. But from there, you became obedient from where? Paul says you became obedient from the heart, from the very core of your being, mission control center, the, the heart, the cardia. You've become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And you have been freed from sin, and you now become losses of righteousness. You are willing bond slaves to Jesus Christ. That is our joy. That is our delight. It is not drudgery. He has made you new to delight in the obedience of Jesus Christ. 
We have been set apart by the Spirit to be faithful and fruitful to God, to love Christ and to obey Him. Salvation produces obedience. Uh, Paul said it's the doctrine that conforms to godliness. We are justified by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. It will produce works. I want you to listen to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel, how do I know he chose me? Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but it came in power and in the Holy Spirit like we studied last week and with full conviction. It came in power, truth. I knew it. I knew I needed a Savior. It, it didn't just, weren't just dead words. It came in power. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. That's how you responded. You imitated Jesus and you imitated us. Having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place that your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned uh, to God from the idols to serve uh, a living and a true God." You were chosen, the word came in power. You've turned from your idols to serve Jesus Christ. First uh, Thessalonians is telling us the exact same thing that Peter is telling us. This is how you know you are the elect. It's not looking in the books. It's do I obey Jesus Christ? The problem is I can't look into the book of life and find my name. I wasn't there before the foundation of the world when God chose his elect. The way that I know I'm elect is that the word came in power and brought about regeneration and I have a new heart that is bent and set on obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes temptation for me not to obey the Lord Jesus Christ because that is my new heart and my new desire and my new longings. This is the difference between fire insurance and being born again. Being born again by the living God. Have you been born again? Do you have this new heart that wants to obey Jesus Christ? And I would even ask you, is that your pursuit daily? Is your frustration that your reach is always exceeding your grasp? I wish I could be more holy than I am. There's a certain exasperation that dwells within the believer. Or is it to get as much of this world as possible, and I just want to add Jesus onto it? To, to, to really deal with these questions with Judgment Day honesty. This is a very important question. And it's one I want you to answer in the quietness of your heart this morning. Do I want to obey the Lord Jesus Christ? It seems like such a simple statement, doesn't it? What I'd like to do with the bulk of our time this morning is look at this next phrase then. I just want to see that it produces a heart that wants to obey Christ. But this little phrase with it is a little trickier. If you'll look with me in verse 2, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. And it kind of seems simple at the first glance. This is salvation. You're sprinkled with his blood and then your sins are washed away. But if you really stay in the context, I think it's a little bit tougher to interpret because Peter has just addressed salvation with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has done its work. It's brought about salvation. Now he's talking about something subsequent to salvation, and that is obedience, that we would obey Jesus Christ. So we looked last week then at that initial sanctification, and I think this is now your progressive sanctification. Now, how do I grow and live to please God? So when does, so what does Peter mean by this statement then? Well, I want to look at Scripture and see if we can figure out then what is he talking about. 
So I started with looking at all the times when the Bible speaks about sprinkling with blood. Peter, what are you getting at? And I thought there were going to be a whole lot of passages on this subject, but I was surprised there were only a few times when things were sprinkled with blood in the Old Testament. And there are just three cases um, which should help us tremendously to figure out what Peter's talking about. You don't need to turn to the first two, but you will for the third one. So even put your hand in Peter and go to Exodus 24. <clears throat> I'm just going to share with you in Leviticus 14.6. This was the case when someone was a leper. You would take the blood of a bird and you would sprinkle it on the one with leprosy seven times and then you would pronounce him clean, which I, I really don't think that's what Peter's talking about. There's no hint of a leper or anything like that in our context. The second time there was sprinkling was the dedication of Aaron and his sons to the priesthood. And in that, they, they took the blood of a, a lamb and they, they sprinkled them uh, in consecrating them unto the priesthood. And I don't, I don't think that interpretation works the best here in Peter as well, because in our context, we're not dealing with a leper or a priest. So I'm pretty confident that what Peter was dealing with is this third case where blood was sprinkled. And this third use was a time before the Levitical legislation, before the Mosaic covenant came, so it must be pretty significant. And so this is a time that's actually mentioned in Hebrews twice. And so I'll look at one of those at the close of our sermon, but if you will just turn and look with me now in Exodus 24, 3 through 8, I actually want to read that together and see what's going on here in that context and why Peter's bringing that up this morning. First, Moses came... And he recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And then he arose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood, and he put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant, and he read it in, in, in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And so Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on all the people and he said, behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. And so this is the people now, they're entering into covenant with God. They're pledging their obedience to God to keep his law that's been revealed now to Moses. And so this is a covenant of obedience uh, with God mediated through sacrifice. And so I want to try to work through this. In ancient times, a covenant, we've, we kind of went over this a little bit, so I won't get stuck on it, but a covenant was cut in blood, and it was placed on, on both parties, and they would make a covenant to say, I'm going to keep the pact between you and me. We saw this a few months back, remember when we looked at the Abrahamic covenant, where they cut the animals in half and put each half and made a row, and then both parties would walk through to say, if I don't keep the covenant, may I, this happen to me. And so it was the way that they sealed covenants. And so please catch this then, in the giving of the law of Moses, the people covenanted with God, we will obey your law, we will keep all the words of this covenant. It was a covenant of, of obedience, and it was sealed in the sprinkled blood. And so this was the covenant between the people of Israel and God. The blood was sprinkled on the people, and that was their part of the covenant. We're going to obey and keep this word. And then the blood was sprinkled on the altar for God's part of the covenant and his faithfulness, the forgiveness of sins because of the sacrificial sprinkled blood. I have no doubt that that is what Peter has in mind here in 1 Peter 1, 2, if you'll turn back to it, to be sprinkled with his blood. So let's try to get our arms around this. Why is Peter even bringing this up? Peter, is, he's writing to believers, to those who are chosen, to those who are aliens, in verse 3, those who have been born again to a living hope. They have been sanctified by the Spirit their past election has become a present reality because they have faith in Jesus Christ. 
They've been brought into now a covenant of obedience, and that is what Peter is after. You have the death of Christ that brought about salvation, and at salvation, you enter into a covenant of obedience. It is, it is very similar maybe to a marriage vow when you stand on an altar with your bride or your groom and you say, I forsake all others, keeping myself only unto him or her. It's a covenant of love and it's a covenant of commitment. I will serve you the rest of my days. And no matter what comes into our relationship, I will love you. If it's sickness or health, if it's joy or sorrow, or if we have plenty, or if we are in want, I'm making a vow to love you. At salvation then, in the new covenant, we accept the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's accomplished everything for salvation, and we believe. But we make a covenant with him. And it's a covenant that I'm gonna obey you, Jesus Christ. This is all wrapped up in salvation. I'm telling you this as plain as I know how to. It cannot be something later that comes to super Christians, really sanctified people. This, this, is, this, is, a, this is salvation. There is a covenant of obedience in it. So we've had 20 to 30 year war in American Christianity if Jesus has to be your Lord or not or just your Savior. And now no one even cares to debate it because it's so far gone from many minds and hearts in the, in the visible church that they don't care anymore. This is the, the very issue of, of you get the gospel, your eyes are open, I covenant to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the new birth, that is all wrapped up in this whole thing as a covenant of obedience to Jesus Christ. I love the new covenant. I can't tell you how much I love the new covenant. It's a promise that the Lord would redeem us, that, he, that he, he, he received his son and raised him up. He would redeem us. And it's a promise that we will obey him. Those are inseparable. Those are inseparable that I uh, receive the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe upon what God has done. And in faith, it's that Jesus is who he is. And he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And there's a covenant then. My eyes are open to understand who he is and what life is about. I'm yours. I, I give my life to now obey you versus my lusts and my desires. That is wrapped up in this covenant. I love it. Jesus said, if you love me, what? You will keep my commandments. It's, it's, they're, they're linked. And if you get this gospel, you, you love me. And you covenant to obey him. I, I, I give you a new covenant with hands with holes in it. And if you love me, you, you will keep my commandments. The work of Christ satisfied the Father and he raised him up to say, it's finished, it really is finished. He accomplished all the veils torn in two. This work received brings us into a covenant of obedience. This is what it means to be a Christian that the world is after you, you're aliens, they hate you, they, they don't love you. You're an alien, you don't fit. And so they're gonna persecute you and, and ridicule you and try to kill you in some cases. But your, your calling from God is that your covenant you made with God is I obey you at any cost. Peter's reminding them there is persecution coming. Nero is breathing down upon you, but you have made a covenant to Jesus Christ to obey even if they lead you to a cross and be crucified upside down as Peter was. There is a commitment, I will obey you to the point of death. That's the covenant that Peter now is bringing in as the, they're breathing threats upon the church. I love you and I will obey you no matter what comes from this world against me. I will not flee from you, Jesus, you have my heart and my soul. That is the cost of salvation. And, and it's just been lost, just lost today. Jesus called for this so many times in his gospel preaching. If you want to come after me, take up your cross and die. Deny yourself and come follow me. I told a rich young ruler to go sell all that you have and then you can have eternal life. 
He told one man, let the dead bury their own dead, follow after me. If anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his father and mother and his wife and children and his own life, he can't be my disciple. If anyone wishes to save his life, he's going to lose it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Jesus spoke a really hard, straight message. Listen to what he's going to say in just a couple chapters in 1 Peter 4.2. This is beautiful. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, there's the gospel and the beauty of all that he's done. Because he's done that, arm yourselves with the same purpose. Have the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And here's your command, to live the rest of the time in the flesh here on earth as aliens, no longer for the lusts of men. Be done living for the lusts of men. You're done with that. Be done with it. Well, what do we live for then? The will of God. I made a covenant of obedience to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to live for the will of God. And I'm done. He says, you've already carried out all your time of partying like the Gentiles and drinking up the things of this world. He's saying, you're done with that. You're done with that. You've made a covenant of obedience to Jesus Christ to live the rest of your life on this earth for the will of God. And in 1 Peter 4, 19, he says, let those who suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. I, I trust you with whatever comes upon me. And, and there's some debate as to is that God doing what is right or you doing what is right? And I lean towards the, just grammatically, it's you doing what is right. No matter what comes upon you, entrust your soul to God and do what is right. No matter what comes and squeezes you and presses you and tempts you, he said, no matter what it is, do what is right. Live for the will of God. You made a covenant of obedience to Jesus Christ at salvation. Where has this gone in our apostate age? The covenant of obedience to Jesus. It has become optional, optional or not even necessary in our day and age. Oh, we're just under grace. And that's what I'm preaching this morning is you're under grace. It's a grace that will change you and transform you and give you good works prepared before the foundation of the world that you should walk through them. This is the grace of God is that you may obey the will of God. Has it affected you? Has it rubbed your edges off this world, that, this church that's lost its focus on obedience? Has it hurt, hit us more than we know? We live in it on a daily basis. Has it rubbed the edges off? Do you sit here living for the lust of the flesh still? Is it, is it we just, are we losing it? Or are we looking at the power of Almighty God? I want you to listen to this, Acts 5.32. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. There's one last part I want to get our arms around and I'm going to dismiss you. Why is the blood then sprinkled on the altar? So it was sprinkled on the people. We'll obey. We're making a covenant. We will obey your law. But why is it sprinkled on the altar? And I'll ask you this. Did Israel keep their covenant to obey God and his law that day? I think they were very sincere when they made that covenant. I don't think one of them didn't think they wouldn't keep it. They'd just been delivered by the ten mighty plagues and parting of a Red Sea and all these things. I think when they made that commitment, they, they were going to obey it. We will keep it. We're going to obey it. We're in. Both feet. But in a little while, they're going to be building idols, a big old golden calf, while Moses is up there getting the law. They're going to go apostate again and again and again. They're going to marry with heathen idolaters. They're going to forsake the law of God completely. And Judges, there's seven cycles of apostasy, judgment. God would raise up a judge, and then they would have victory. And it just kept repeating itself again and again and again. This was the pattern of Israel. Josiah, they, they didn't even know what the law of God was anymore. And he finds the book of the law, and he reads it, and there's this massive revival among Israel. 
and they were taken into captivity again and again for the harlotries that they had against God. It, what, that was their history of not keeping the covenant that they made with God. That you just trace it through the whole Testament. What, what was it like for Israel? They, they made covenants to obey them and they didn't do it. In fact, I want you to listen to something powerful. This is in Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much, this is Jesus, he is the mediator of a better covenant. So that old covenant, this is one that's better, the new covenant. It's been enacted on better promises. I like the new covenant way better than the old. For if that first covenant was faultless, there would have never been an occasion sought for a second one. We don't need a new covenant if that one worked, but it didn't work. And for finding fault with them, he says, God, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in what? My covenant. The promise they made, he's saying, they didn't continue in it, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Under that covenant, they didn't keep it, and God says, I did not care for them. For this is the covenant then that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's what we looked at last week. The Spirit will do that in your life. And they shall not teach every one of his fellow citizens and every one of his brothers saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. A little child here, if you know Jesus, you're as near to God as the older saints. It's, I, they will all know me and I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more under this new covenant. So he said a new covenant, he's made the first one obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old, it's ready to disappear. That old covenant is fading away and done. And I need a, a better covenant because I can't keep the law of God. I can't obey Jesus' commands. When we went through the Sermon on the Mount, I was left speechless when I look at the law of love, to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, I fail daily. I have made so many commitments to obey Jesus and have fallen so many times. I feel like Israel. Just commitment and failure to keep it all the time. And now there's a new covenant with higher standards. You heard don't murder, I say don't even get angry. Don't commit adultery, I say if you even lust. So here's a higher commandment. It's going higher, it goes to the heart. What good is that? Sure, sprinkle me with your blood, I covenant to keep it. And I feel it with all my heart. I want to keep it with all my heart. It's written there. From the very inside, I want to keep every word that Jesus has commanded me because of the new birth. But I just come to the place again and again with failure. Well, I want you to hear the new covenant this morning. There was blood that was sprinkled on the altar as well. And this time it was not an animal that was slain as a substitute. This time it was the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who was our substitute that hung on a cross in our place. And now the blood is sprinkled on the altar. And was God's commitment then to forgiveness is that God with the sprinkled blood, I will forgive your iniquities. I will remember them no more, he said. I, I will put them as far as the east is from the west. And this covenant, we make a covenant where we promise to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus presents his blood to the Father and he sprinkles it. And God forgives our sins and he separates them as far as the east is from the west. It's like that, that lamb, he takes them away into forgetfulness. And so under this covenant, I want you to hear this, you will never hear these words from God, for they did not continue in my covenant and I don't care for them. 
that, that love that we saw before the foundation of the world that he's put on you, he, as a believer in Christ, he will never say, I don't care for you because you didn't keep my covenant. And so I pray that every weary saint would hear that this morning. If we fail to keep our covenant to God to obey Jesus Christ, I will be merciful to their iniquities. I will be gracious and I will forgive their sins. I want you to just, we'll close out, turn to Hebrews chapter nine. The writer takes up this concept You'll be a son forever and nothing can separate you from my love. You will never hear those words, I don't care for you. Isn't that beautiful? I don't care for you. God will never say those to his children because of the new covenant. The new covenant that is a covenant that Jesus has fulfilled in keeping the law. He kept its, its consequences by dying and he kept its positive by being the very reflection of it. And so Jesus Christ in the new covenant, he has fulfilled all the law's demands so that now we're reconciled, we have relationship in him. We have new hearts that desire from the inner being to love and obey Jesus Christ. But we have a sprinkled blood for every time that we come short under the new covenant. Hebrews 9, I'm gonna begin in verse one. I might need to read a little fast. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary. So this is that old tabernacle. For there was a tabernacle prepared, and you had the outer one, in which were the lampstand, the table, and the sacred bread, and it's called the holy place. And behind the second veil, there's a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies. Having a golden altar of incense in the ark of the covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which budded, and the tables of the covenant, Ten Commandments. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now then, these things have been thus prepared. The priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into that second place, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest enters once a year, and not without taking blood which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. <clears throat> the blood sprinkled that would cover their sins then. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, listen to this, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. They could never cleanse perfectly the conscience for sin. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So they, they really didn't uh, cleanse the conscience uh, rightly and perfectly. And so they're, they're waiting for a time of reformation, which was Jesus Christ dying on a cross and that veil being torn in two. So verse 11, when Christ appeared then as a high priest, of the good things to come, the new covenant, he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not the one made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. He went right into heaven and not through the blood of goats and calves, but he entered through his own blood, royal divine blood that was spilt as a substitute. He entered into the holy place once and for all with that blood now and that accomplishment having obtained an eternal redemption, a redemption that is forever, a redemption that uh, it's, it's eternal and it, it will never end. Your conscience can finally be cleansed permanently, forever, and purely with this work of Christ. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling uh, those who have been defiled sanctify the cleansing of the flesh, how much more Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, the, that old covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of this internal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. 
For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it's never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood, as we've seen. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled the book itself and all of the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and the vessel of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say that all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So we could say with the shedding of Jesus' blood, there is forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, the blood of Jesus. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, the tabernacle, but he went into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as to the high priest enters the holy place year by year uh, with blood, not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the consummation of the ages. At the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin forever by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, because it's been dealt with to those who eagerly await him, to those who are longing and waiting for the return of the one they love more than anyone else, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so guys, where I want to close with then is your chosen aliens. By the foreknowledge of God, he set his love on you before the foundation of the world. He sanctified you by his spirit. He, he gave life to this. He, he opened your eyes and now Christ is that value and that treasure. You love him. And so therefore you want to obey Jesus and you want to be sprinkled with his blood so that now we are in a covenant that we will never hear the words, I do not care for them. That can never happen to the child of God. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Nothing will ever separate us from his love. We are made new with the law in our hearts and in our minds to love God and to love other people, to obey Jesus in all things. And no matter how hot it gets in the kitchen, how much persecution comes upon us, no matter what the cost of following Christ, we have covenanted to obey him at any price. And when we fail, hallelujah, this covenant is not based on our works, but it's based on the one who never failed. All hell was thrown against him. You, you think the people were persecuted by Nero? <laughs> Jesus had all hell thrown against him. The world and the devil poured out all that they had upon him, and he just kept obeying the Father at any price. And that obedience is ours. God puts that to your account this morning, and that's why you're accepted in the beloved. It's not your obedience that gets you accepted. So it's, it's, you're not running this morning to get acceptance. You're running because you are accepted. And there's a whole difference. One, one will destroy you and one will make you. Why are you running? Because you're accepted or to get accepted? And so I cry this morning a renewed commitment to Southside Bible Church. Fight for obedience. No longer live for the lusts of man, but for the will of God as we dwell in this covenant in a perfect one relationship with Jesus Christ that now has our hearts and we want to obey Jesus. Find great joy and peace that your acceptance is not based on how, how well you do it, your obedience, but it's all based on his obedience. This is so good. Doesn't that make you want to obey him all the more? <laughs> just stirs the heart saying, I just want to live all the more because I'm forgiven and accepted and I have his uh, covenant. And so Jesus... There's just something about that name. 
And the last thought as we close, Jesus was the ultimate exile on this earth. He, he was truly an alien. He, he was at home with the Father and the Spirit for all of eternity. That's where he should be. That's where he dwelt. That was his home. It's where he belonged in perfect love and perfect fellowship in the Trinity. He's at the bosom of the Father. He left home. And he truly became an exile here on this earth. His citizenship was somewhere else. He truly was an alien. His, his own didn't receive him, the Jewish race. He was despised and rejected of men. He had nowhere to lay his head. He did not fit in the world that he created. The fallenness of man hated its creator. He was a sojourner. He just didn't belong. So much so that they hung him up on a cross and he cried on that cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was homeless because he lost the Father's presence and favor for the first time in all of eternity. He's there homeless. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was exiled so that you could be brought home. And now by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're home with the Father. You've been made in his image. You've been made for him. It brings you back home. You were chosen by him. You are loved by him. You are restored to him and you are adopted by him so that now you can actually be rejected by this world. You made a covenant to obey him at any cost. Those are your marching orders. We need that revived and refreshed in our hearts. And we need to remember that this covenant is based solely on his obedience for our acceptance. So when we come short, his blood has been sprinkled on the altar in heaven, not made with hands, and we have an eternal redemption. And I want to tell you this morning, your sins are gone, gone. And I look at it this way, Jesus died the big death so that we can die the little one of being rejected in this world. Let them persecute you, let them kill you, because no one can harm you. No one can truly harm you. Let that get you fired up and prepared for the days that are upon us and are fast approaching. And as he closes in 1 Peter with howdy, grace and peace then in fullest measure. Grace is the gift I just described and peace is the result that comes from it. And it's in, in the Greek, it's in what's called the optative, which means it's a wish. And Paul says then, I just wish for you all to have everything that God can possibly give. I wish you all the blessings of being God's elect because he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I just want you to have everything that God can give. The gracious, free God. May he give you grace and peace as we are chosen aliens in this world that is coming upon us. So I beg you as I close, don't run from election. Run to it and find the eternal blessings that can shower you and make you strong to stand in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Peter saw it as the key to endure persecution. And I pray that it has overwhelmed your heart with a God who could love you in that way. It's an eternal love and it will last forever. It will never end. And you, by the grace of God, have been brought into that. We have much to marvel and rejoice and obey the one who would love us in that way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the glorious gospel and I pray that our hearts have been renewed again by your love to desire this covenant of obedience. Lord, that we want to no longer live for our flesh, the lusts of them, but to live for the will of God. Lord, to set our hearts on that, that most important thing now as we love our king, we love our, our lawgiver. We delight, we are one with him and therefore we love his law. We love to obey. We delight in it. It's in our heart. It's in our minds. And I just pray, Lord, for a renewed obedience in every saint here this morning. And I pray for any who have come into our midst, Father, who um, are still trying to, to run to get your acceptance. They're still trying to do all the right things to clean themselves up so that you will love them. And I pray this morning that they would cast that down and they would realize that their only hope is that they can't clean themselves up, but there's one who can. And that they would look to the one who hung in their place on a cross 
and that they would believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. To not try to go do something, but to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And to have all the blessings and be brought into relationship with God and to be made just and right and safe in His presence. God, I, I pray for any here this morning that need to call upon Jesus that they would do that. Lord, thank you for meeting us here in the Word of God. Thank you for this beautiful introduction that you have uh, given to us through the Holy Spirit by the instrument of Peter. God, we thank you for it. Bless your people. Do the work that only you can do through the Word of God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.